Well, welcome to everybody here today. I'm delighted you're with us for what is going to be an absolutely fascinating uh, discussion. And I think I'm not exaggerating when I say that migration has become probably one of the defining issues of our time. It's a highly charged social and political conundrum that's exposed divisions right across the world. It's recalibrated politics, at times brutally unmasking the haves and the haves nots, forcing us to search deep to reevaluate our morals, and that on a global scale. Now, UN figures tell us that there are some 260 million migrants. And although this figure is absolutely vast, I think we can say it's also very personal. Now, I myself am a migrant. I know members of our panel are, and I imagine many of you here in this room are too. And according to the OECD, this is a figure that is going to grow. 80% of the world's poor live in areas that are defined as fragile. Now, there was celebration last year with the, celeb with the uh, signing of the Global Migration Pact, but that was also overshadowed to an extent by the countries that didn't sign it. Uh, the US was one of the countries at the forefront of that, as were many EU nations. Um, so from Donald Trump to Jair Bolsonaro to Viktor Orban, I think we're in new territory. So if this is indeed an issue that's not going to go away, what steps are we going to take? And I've got a fantastic panel to discuss this. Let me introduce myself. I'm Isabel Kumar from Euronews. And let me tell you who is with us to help us kind of shed light, but hopefully come up with some actionable steps uh, as we look forward. So uh, we're joined uh, by Antonio Manuel Vitorino, who is the Director General of the International Organization for Migration. Tudor uh, Ulyanovsky, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs and European Integration of Moldova. Yasmina Filali, uh, thanks for being with us, the founder and president uh, of the Fondation Orient Occident Morocco. A bit of a mixture of French and English there. Um, Pavel Sorowska, who's the chief executive officer of PZU, Poland's biggest and oldest insurance company. So he's going to bring a bit of a business voice, the private sector voice, to our discussion, as will Mr. Stanley uh, no. Bergman, who is the CEO yeah, yeah. of... Henry Shine, oh my God, my, oh, I have a real problem. I don't have my contact lenses. <laughs> Stanley Bergen, who is the CEO of Henry Shine, and that is a company of, a, of the one, the Fortune uh, 500, uh, was designated as one of the most ethical companies in the world. So I think what we're going to do is to try and get a bit of perspective from each of the people here with us today. And I'd like to start with you, uh, Mr. Vitorino. Um, so the IOM has 172 member states, eight observer states. Um, can you tell us the trends? What are you seeing now? And how do you think a migration is going to develop in the years ahead? And let's take a, a, probably a short-term view of this. Well, just very briefly to say that, uh, uh, of course, the Global Compact on Migration that you've mentioned is uh, definitely a milestone for international cooperation in the field of migration. From the 172 member states of IOM, uh, the vast majority have subscribed to the Global Compact. There are a number, uh, one dozen, mm. 15 member states that did mm. not subscribe because precisely the Global Compact is a volunteer platform. Mm. So countries who want to participate, they participate. Countries who do not want to join. For us, from our perspective, we work equally with all our member states. Mm. Because from one thing, we are absolutely sure. No country alone will be able to handle the challenges of current migratory flows. So international cooperation is needed. Those countries who want to develop their international cooperation in the framework of the global compact will find in our OM a supportive partner. Those countries who did not subscribe to the Global Compact, but who are engaged in international cooperation, go on counting with IOM as a reliable partner, as they have been doing for all these 67 years of the organization. So what was the purpose of signing it then, if you, if you have the same level of engagement? Oh, from the IOM perspective. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm talking on behalf of IOM. But from the worldwide perspective, I think that uh, it's up to member states who have subscribed to the Global mm -hmm. Compact 
to identify what are the priorities they need to start implementing. Because we are dealing with countries of origin, transit and destination. We have different agenda, mm -hmm. different priorities. But the secret is that no country alone can deal with the challenge. So there is a need to bring together countries of transit, countries of origin, countries of destination. And the Global Compact is a very useful and practical mm -hmm. platform to bring them together, to share responsibilities, and trying to generate synergies to deal with, you have mentioned, 258 million mm -hmm. migrants today, but uh, we cannot ignore that uh, the pressure of increasing migratory mm -hmm. flows is there, not only because of conflicts, but also because of new drivers like, for instance, climate change, which is starting producing large movements of people mm -hmm. all over the world. And that is something we're going to definitely be broaching uh, later on in the discussion. But um, I'd like to bring in uh, you, Minister. Now, Moldova is quite an interesting case. It's uh, because a quarter of the population has actually left in search of a better life, uh, either or temporarily or permanently. Now, what kind of impact does this have on your country? Well, definitely for us, uh, Global Compact for Migration mm. was extremely important uh, treaty. And let's not forget that for a new treaty, non-legally binding treaty, the amount of support that this uh, document has received uh, was, uh, was very important, very substantial. Moldova has contributed to the text of it. For the Republic of Moldova particularly, is extremely important uh, to address the matter of migration, but also the diaspora that we have. Around 25% of Moldovans are outside. Mm -hmm. So uh, the main priority for the government of the Republic of Moldova is, first of all, to create sustainable economic development in the country. So we try to encourage uh, the uh, members from the diaspora either to invest in Moldova or either to invest and let their relatives manage uh, the, uh, the businesses in Moldova so we keep the connection between them. The amount of remittances at this moment uh, is approximately 20% of the GDP. Which is massive. Which is massive. And for us, it is extremely important uh, to create the link and to maintain mm. the link, the connection between the uh, people outside with the country of origin. And uh, for that purpose, we have also uh, taken the opportunity offered by the Global Compact for Migration and the 2030 Sustainable Development mm -hmm. Agenda. So in our national development strategy, the government has also included one of the objectives, the safe orderly and efficient migration. Mm -hmm. So now this is our national policy and it's our full government support for that. And uh, we are working with the European Union, with the partners to create these programs to convince diaspora not only to send remittances, but also to provide more opportunities. And we have more that have been involved in economic development projects in their own uh, countries or destination. And we think that knowledge transfer, remittances uh, transfer, might be a very good channel for economic development of Moldova. So very briefly, so the Global Migration Pact in some respects has given you a very useful infrastructure uh, to be able to enable you to manage the migration flows better, which, which was ultimately its intention. Mm -hmm. Well, we could say that uh, we are a, uh, we see this as a positive mm -hmm. document. It streamlines the process, it addresses the drives, the human made, mm -hmm. but also the environmentally made. And we do see this as an opportunity for us to be more vocal, for the government to be more vocal mm -hmm. on this issue, because we have to address. But for this, we need to have two more elements. We need to work in a more organized, holistic fashion mm -hmm. with the business sector, uh, and we are now trying to attract foreign investment in Moldova, but also with the civil society group to raise awareness, but also to drive the legislative framework that relates to uh, migration, but also to work on the border management, because Moldova is a uh, associated member of the European Union. Mm -hmm. So we need to have a very good border management system, system in that regard. Yeah, which is, uh, I think, a recurrent uh, issue that comes up when we talk about migration. Uh, Yasmina Filali, now you've been working uh, in Morocco. Um, now, your Morocco is not only a transit country, it's also a country of origin. The situation is really quite complex there. Um, what's happening there at the moment? So uh, we have been operating in, in Morocco when in 2006 we have the uh, arrival of uh, sub-Saharan uh, people to our country. And in fact, at the beginning we were a hosting country and now we are uh, a transit country. And now we are a hosting country. So um, 
our matter was uh, to understand how we were going to integrate the people uh, into our society. So we have been working for many years, and uh, the key question where uh, how are we going to change the image of a migrant? How are we going to build uh, bridges into in between the two uh, communities? And uh, but let me allow uh, to to talk uh, one second and very briefly um, about identity mm -hmm. because uh, migration carries with it uh, the question of identity, and you cannot uh, talk and. Uh, go into a process, into an integration, without this uh, key question. You have two levels. The first one is the personal one that uh, uh, we don't share with anyone, and uh, that makes you unique as a person. And you have the second level, which is uh, the collective one. It's mm. the one that you have with your community, the religion, the behaviors. And in one face-to-face -face between communities, if you don't a debate, if you don't talk about it, if you don't show where are the rules, what can, can you concede or not to the other, then you will have a problem. So for us, it was the first step in order to give uh, the best condition uh, of a successful uh, integration. So this was very important to us. And then we had a, a, a wide range of interculturality activities that maybe we'll talk after, we mechanisms. Definitely. So, Pavel Svorska, now I saw you nodding, and this was something we were discussing earlier, is that question of integration of identity. Now, you've got a very interesting story yourself, because you're Polish, you live in Germany. Now, now how do you live with this almost binary uh, identity, and how did you integrate yourself into the societies you live in? And what have you seen? It's even more complicated, because <laughs> then I went to France. So now, <laughs> but, you know, it's true, I mean, when I was six years old, my parents, uh, you know, fled communist Poland, and obviously I cannot compare this in any way to, you know, the situation of people mm -hmm. fleeing Syria. But still, you know, I, I remember exactly, you know, as a child, the idea of having everything that you own in a car, and then arriving in a, in a place that you absolutely don't know, and having to adapt to the to the culture, and then having, you know, lived in Germany, and then, you know, married to, you know, my wife is German, and we're back in Poland right now, so I know the angle of, you know, the, the person who has to adapt the culture, and the person, you know, and then the, the uh, the view of the culture which is actually receiving the people. And I think it's extremely important and we always un underestimate the element that it's important that people have some kind of culture and some kind of identification with the place that they live. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it, it, it's not linked to migration, but in the, in the time uh, when in Poland the, the, de the democratic institutions were formed after the, 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 the fall of the Soviet Union, we had one uh, poet and philosopher, Zbigniew Herbert, who said one very wise thing, I said, he said, you know, you have democracy and cohesion in a social structure, not when you have the parliament and the president. You have it when somebody looks out of the window and he or she sees a hooligan destroying a park bench and they feel like they have to act because this is their park bench. Mm -hmm. And this is the level where, you know, you can speak about having a community. And I think that we don't speak enough about the, the responsibility that business has to creating this sense of community. And you know, here in Davos, I've been in panels and everybody speaks about purpose. Mm. And you know, we're speaking about uh, social responsibility of, of, of corporations. I think that this cultural element and this identification element of the workplace is not enough valued because if you live together in a country but you don't share the religion, mm. you don't share the same zip code, you don't go to the same sports teams, then probably the only place where you would actually meet is your workplace. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely important, I think, that business leaders think about what kind of culture they create yeah. and what, you know, where they are open about, where they try to be diverse, where they try to be inclusive, and where they try to be strict about. So and, you have you know, to instill particular programs to do this in the workplace. It's not something that happens organically. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, and it's, it's a process, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, even my company, you know, we, we, we're becoming more international, so I have to adapt to the fact that, you know, I can all, not always speak of us as a national company, but as an international company. And obviously you also have to find, you know, a kind of also the elements that you are strict about, mm -hmm. like for example, you know, women rights and, and inclusion. 
And I think that you know, business leaders have a responsibility, and, and we have to acknowledge that, that this is probably the place where integration happens mm. most of the time. Well, Stanley Bergen, this is the perfect moment to bring you in. Now, you also have a very interesting story. As your parents fled Nazi Germany in the 30s. You grew up in apartheid South Africa. You now live in the States. But if I understand rightly, your parents instilled in you a very clear set of values that guide you probably not only through your personal life, but also very much in how you run your business. Now, what are those values? So, Isabella, I think this is a very important debate to be taking place here at the World Economic Forum because business cannot ignore the immigration issue. And... Uh, in, in a sense, business, many business leaders are sort of abrogating that responsibility to the NGOs, to government. And so the way I see it is that there are three forms of migration. The first is, of course, when labor is needed. So you have the people that work on the farms in California, you have the Gastarbeiten in Germany. And we're going to need more of this in the developed world mm -hmm. because the population is growing and they're just not going to be enough millennials. So we're going to have to come to terms with how to deal with this. In the US, we're struggling. In fact, it's almost on halt, and the farmers in California are starting to realize this is a big issue. The second is the professionals. Um, many of the developed world eco eco economies, in particular the US, has been driven, have been driven by the immigration of skilled professionals. So if you look at the Fortune 500, just about 50% of the Fortune 500 companies were founded by first or second generation immigrants. Mm. And if you actually look at now the startups, you'll see that startups that are worth about a billion dollars or more, 50% were founded by immigrants. We are shutting down this whole area. We in my company are having a challenge finding programmers. We put these uh, people through the US educational system, which is partially subsidized, and then we ask them to leave. But the, 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 the other issue, of course, is the uh, humanitarian challenge. Mm. And we in business cannot look the other way. Of course, it's a terrible thing from a humanitarian point of view, and we should do something about it. But from a business point of view, if we do not deal with the migration issue, the, the uh, uh, people that are leaving for political and economic reasons, we end up with a situation of security and there are no borders that we're going to be able to build enough fences to solve this issue. Because in the end, it's about moving health issues around the world and you cannot stop that at all with fences, with visas, hmm. and you have to deal with this. And so business cannot duck this issue. And I'm very pleased that this is being discussed here at the World Economic Forum because in the health area, we could be challenged with migrants who are not being handled in the right way, or not handled, but are not being uh, managed in the right way or encouraged uh, to participate in society, actually being the carriers of, uh, of a potential pandemic. So this is something that business needs to get involved with, and right now we can't wait. Well, just in a nutshell, but very briefly now, so we can move on to the next stage of discussion, what, what, were you, what are you advocating? How does business do yes. this? Because it's a massive, you know, it's, it's quite a big ask. Well... To me, after the Second World War, we had the Marshall Plan. Mm -hmm. And that was designed, I guess, to stop the spread of communism or whatever, uh, whatever the, the issues were of the day. We need to have a Marshall Plan, USAID, the German equivalent, the Japanese equivalent, need to get involved in providing support to organizations that are doing something about the migrants. And the biggest thing is we have to create jobs in these countries. Uh, you know, when... NAFTA was put into place. Mm. A couple of years later, the number of illegal immigrants into the United States went down because jobs were moved mm. to Mexico. We need to help countries that are generating these migrants develop their economies. So, so do businesses have to take the risk and invest in fragile economies? I mean, absolutely. And, and you know, it, it's... it's it's such a you know multi-dimensional uh, multi-dimensional question because in a, in a certain way uh, yes there's 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 the debate going on whether on the one hand you know business leaders like in Germany say you know we have to we have to have migrants because you know we need to we, we need to um, increase our demographics we, our industry needs them 
And on the other hand, we say, okay, we don't need the migrants, we don't want them because, you know, just imagine everybody enters Europe. Um, but, you know, the, there is the other part that we probably don't speak enough about, that when you look at the real sources of, you know, mass migration to, to, to Europe right now, be it Syria, be it terrorism, or be it like failed states, like um, you probably could make the case Libya, you know, we can not all the time look at them like they were natural catastrophes. You know, we also have our part in that mm. as Europeans. And, and so you, you have to acknowledge that you know, when you look at the total cost that the migration, for example, in Syria has, uh, has caused for everyone, and you would go back to the you know, decision that you know, when the world leaders took the decision of actually not doing enough about Syria, probably if you could take the net sum of it, you would probably come up to the conclusion that having acted in Syria in the first place would have been the better decision, both humanitarian and economic. And I think that, you know, once we... we easy in hindsight, though, is it Easy not? in hindsight, but obviously, uh, but obviously that, that, that should probably steer also more thinking about what we do at the sources of the mm -hmm. migration. Now, I know Mr. Olivowski, uh, we'd like to cut in there. Thank you, Isabel. Just quickly to react to that. Well, first of all, we just talk about this uh, concept of social responsibility. Uh, and I do think that uh, uh, businesses, when they are analyzing the potential market, and uh, they have taken into consideration not only the profit, but also the fact that we talk about not migration flows, but we talk about flows of people, mm -hmm. of men, women, children. And in any analysis, not only profit or capital has to be put into consideration, but also the fact that we have to help the people to uh, find jobs. We have to create the jobs that eventually, in the long term, will return the investment. So maybe perhaps with the risk of delaying the return of the investment, but focus on creating the jobs. So maybe more risk, but it's more social and humanitarian approach. Second, what you were referring with regards to the businesses and the very important role that they have. And I think that business is a, the, the, vein, the vein that runs through the entire global community right now. And I do think that we have to take into advantage that we are in Davos, mm -hmm. we are discussing about the fourth industrial revolution. Business has the entire data and statistics on where jobs are needed, in what areas are needed. And if we would be able, and we are now discussing mm -hmm. also with some companies like Salesforce and others, to create a platform, an online platform, uh, that will have statistics and data from the business, from various regions, various countries, talking about mm -hmm. concrete actions. Yeah, no, this is where, amazing. Yeah. Where would have, we would have, for example, countries and the needs, mm -hmm. which areas, what kind of pre, uh, prerequisites, what studies, what mm -hmm. capabilities people need to have to find jobs. And other countries will have the opportunity to identify where to invest, in what kind of education to invest. In Moldova right now, we are promoting this concept of e-learning to be the first country in the world to have a full country reference on e-learning. To have a platform for learning online, everyone will have access to, and there will be vocational education, and others, and ideally to have it matched with countries where they need for uh, labor force. And in this case, we can have a more realistic uh, achievement of the target of orderly migration, that people go somewhere, they know where to go, they know why to go. And here I do think that the collecting the statistics from the business is important. I, I could I just, I'd like to bring in the Director General here just quickly and then you can come in and I'd also like to hear from you, um, I'd like to hear your reaction to this. But so people um, have said, or well, countries have said that the, the global compact for migration was toothless because it's not legally binding. Now here we've got a very concrete yeah. example of what could be done and I'd just like to hear your reaction to that. I think that the, one of the most important points of the global compact, which should be read in uh, connection with the sustainable development goals, the agenda 2030 of the United Nations, as the minister has said, is that for the first time there is a clear link between migratory flows and development policy. If you see and if you read the millennial goals, you will see that this link is not there. But if you see Agenda 2030 for the first time, mm -hmm. the link is there. Why? It's there because if you want to be serious to address the deep root causes of migration, mm -hmm. you need to start questioning the policies that you are implementing in the countries of origin. What kind of policies can contribute mm -hmm. 
for the development of those countries. Because usually we speak about these issues in the perspective of the countries of destination. Yeah. But you forget that the ones who migrate from countries of origin are not only the massive and skilled people. Mm. Quite often are the more skilled people that the probably... taxpayers of those countries have invested mm -hmm. in training and preparing. So we preparing. see the brain drain. And, the, brain drain. It's, and therefore, we need to strike the right balance between regular migration, safe, mm. orderly and regular migration, but at the same time, those who benefit from the, this migration, the countries of destination, are also prepared to engage directly and in cooperation with the private sector to invest in the countries of origin to a certain extent, quote unquote, to compensate those movements of qualified people and above all to create jobs down there to prevent people from moving. People usually like to live in the place where they were born mm -hmm. because they have a project of life there and you need to create hope. And hope nowadays is something that you need to start creating, especially to those who are more prone to migrate, which are the youth. And Morocco has lost hope. I think many young Moroccans have lost hope. Unemployment is high. So how do you regenerate that hope then? Could, we, could you react to well, uh, what the Director General was saying? Difficult to regenerate hope in some countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I would like to, to say uh, about work, because work is key for integration to work, uh, as we say, um, is that you have to prepare both sides. Because, yes, you have the private sector, and here in Davos we have a lot of CEOs very aware of uh, going into that dynamic. But on the ground, it's completely different. You have to prepare the migrants on one side, and you have to prepare the population in the other side. So we have been uh, in, in Morocco for some time um, doing some pilots in the enterprises, in the schools, and now we are ready to implement those in Italy, where we start uh, a year ago to, to, to do that uh, kind of mechanism in order to lift uh, this, uh, this purpose. And it's a long-term work, uh, because we are talking about mindsets. And again, it's very important um, to have uh, activities around cultural fields, mm -hmm. citizenship, again, it's very important. Um, and you cannot just say, okay, we're going to um, be all aware of it without preparing. And again, preparing is a long-term system. So, uh, Mr. Srovsky, we were talking about this earlier, the question of identity. Now, Germany uh, has gone through almost a crisis since 2015 when Angela Merkel opened her doors to migrants, mostly from Syria, uh, fleeing persecution there. But there has been an identity crisis in Germany. So, so how do you manage that better in a situation like Germany where there are massive flows of people in need of help? For, from your experience, what you saw? I mean, and, and, and this is, uh, again, such a complex matter, mm. but if I may just, I will answer that question, yep. just may very briefly answer on, on, on what the minister said, and just for the purpose of the discussion, yes, business has their responsibility, but you cannot outsource geopolitics to business. I mean, toppling the regime in Libya was not a business decision, and not entering Syria was not a business decision, and leaving Iraq and, you know, allowing the caliphate to form and, you know, this and that tribe's pride of ISIS was not a business decision. So you cannot, you have to find political decisions for political problems, and you, can, you cannot say, okay, we've done all this, and now business, please sort it out for us. So in a certain way, business has its responsibility, but it, it also has its um, it also has its, its challenges and, and its I, limitations. Could you just react? Because I, I found your scheme that you're describing quite interesting. Now, as a, as a fellow businessman, what do you think about this scheme of being able to identify needs in different countries and send people there? Do, do you see that as, as something that would be viable, that could be set, put into place? Yes, but you need the right platform to work mm. on that. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really difficult from a pure corporate point of view to really make the case of saying, okay, we want to participate in that. So you would need the right, you know, uh, you would need the right platform to, to engage business into that. And again, you have to create the political framework mm -hmm. for, for us, you know, being to step into that. And, 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 and going back, uh, and going back to, to, to what you mentioned on, on Germany, I think that by now it has come down from what I can see and, and you know, having the discussions with, with my friends over there, it has come down to, to a element of, of trust into institutions. 
because um, as in the beginning, the entire debate in Germany was, are we able to do that? Are we able to accommodate that element of migration? And you know, should we do it? Uh, are we the right country to do it? Right now, the, the question all the time is that, have we led in the right people? And yeah. it's a discussion about, you know, have our institutions been able to cope with the elements of migration, have we let in the people who actually, you know, were real refugees, or have we just let in economic uh, flows? And you know, the discussions right now that you know I'm having all the time is, you know, they have bigger iPhones than we have, and, and I think this is that not the media though. Is that not playing into kind of the, the, the very uh, kind of attritional media that's taken hold in these situations, who have shifted the discourse? Because we are seeing a great deal of need, but then we see that we're focusing on things like iPhones. This is just kind of like a side story, is it not? Of course, I mean, uh, it always is. But you know, people look for visible signs of you know whether they are they are happy with this decision or not, and they look of how does my city's landscape mm -hmm. change, what is my everyday interactions with the people I meet, and at the end of the day, it's an underlying matter of trust. Like, do we, uh, you know, the people that we have have here. Are we, um, you know, do are we really compelled to help them, and you know, and do they really need the help? And and again, it's I think uh, the process was much about, you know, have we taken the decision in the right process? And 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 uh, obviously, the fact that some of the institutions were overwhelmed was doing a disservice to the people who are really worthy of, you know, refugee status. Because mm -hmm. when people question whether you came to <coughs> Germany or to any other European country for the right purposes, then, then obviously everybody's under a certain suspicion and, and you don't make the distinction between the people who really need the help and those who don't. I, I'm going to ask you a question in a second, and this is more because we are talking more about migration flows and not necessarily refugee flows. And yeah. the Global Migration Pact uh, wasn't signed by a number of countries because probably of a question of trust, and I will bring you in in a second too. So, so how do you bring that trust back in these international institutions? Because people have lost trust. People, I was speaking to some ministers here who off the record were saying, we don't like the word pact. We don't want to feel obliged and forced into something that we don't want to because we have lost trust in the institutions who are putting these uh, pacts into place. Well, but in fact, those institutions like the High Commissioner for Refugees mm -hmm. or IOM, are present at the current moment uh, in uh, seven major crises all over the world, delivering humanitarian assistance. The Secretary General of the United Nations re reminded us today that uh, 100 million people benefited from the action of the UN just last year in basic humanitarian mm -hmm. assistance. My organization together with UNHCR guarantees the food for 4.5 million people every day in Yemen. So I don't think it's the lack of uh, uh, results that these organizations can be blamed of. Mm -hmm. I think that it is a lack of trust in general, starting with trust in national authorities and mm -hmm. national governments. Let's not hide that point. And uh, definitely without the cooperation of uh, countries uh, and uh, internal, international organizations and the private sector, the complexity of the challenge cannot be dealt with. And you have people on the move that are refugees, that uh, they flee from persecution. You have economic migrants. You have internally displaced people. You know how many people are internally displaced in the world? 40 million people. Mm. People who had to move from the place where they live to another place inside the same country because of drought or because of floods or because of a hurricane or because of a volcano <laughs> or because of the slow climate erosion. So we are dealing with different categories of people and there is a need to have a global approach so that we can address the humanitarian needs of each of them and find solutions of livelihood for those people, and we are talking about uh, 30 million refugees, 40 million internally displaced people, and... And that almost seems too vast to deal with, but, I, I, you know, for, for, a, for a single person, for a small country like Moldova, for a company, when you look at those vast numbers, how do you break it down, then? So, so first of all, by the way, this immigration issue, if you look at the US, has been on the agenda for... 200 years. It's always the latest immigration group that is not like, that is, you know, now they're doing drugs, another time they were doing other things, but, so put that aside. At the end of the day, 
These issues, if we really want to make progress, will only be resolved through public-private partnerships. We need government, we need the multinationals, we need business, we need the NGOs. And I'll give you a very simple example. One of the big challenges faced prior to SARS was creating a, national, a global supply chain network where you would know where to find masks if there was an issue. During one of these discussions, four years ago, a group of multinational people got together and said to business, come help us solve it. Well, we now have a yeah. network where we know where to find gloves the next time there's an issue in cleaning solutions. We need the same kind of issue, uh, uh, process, mm -hmm. process, yeah. And I remember sitting on a panel with the late Kofi Annan, I said, if you call business, they will come. Mm -hmm. And if you call us, we will come. We, not in a lot of discussion, but if you have a specific issue you want to resolve, we will come. Because there are enough good companies that understand enlightened self-interest. What's good for the society and for business is aligned. So, Environment. And there is an You'll awakening come. in that sense, I think, as we were talking about the globalization 4.0, there does seem to be a kind of a change happening in that respect where businesses realize that they have to be a little bit more inclusive. And as you said, for self-interest as well. But is that something you're finding the way, on the ground? That particular issue, yeah. if you don't deal with it as a, as a large company, mm -hmm. you will not be able to employ millennials because they will only join companies, the good ones, if they realize the company is socially responsible. Mm -hmm. But we can't convene the world you guys can. <laughs> so I believe, of course, in the network and uh, working with UNHCR, I can testify as an NGO on the ground that you save uh, thousands and millions of lives. Um, but uh, I would like to uh, make a point that you were saying before, in the terms of uh, globalization, we are talking about here in Davos, uh, it is maybe the time also to understand what is going on in those countries of origin, what is the problem of the leadership, and what is the problem of the governance, and how can we together uh, in the eastern side uh, has a possibility of having a, a new governance, a new framework, because uh, we have to act on that side too. Mr. Petrino, what would your reaction be to that? Well, of course, the governance conditions in the countries of origin are extremely important to create conditions for the people to live there mm -hmm. and also to attract investment to create jobs. That's one of the key points. But as the minister was giving us a very interesting example, the challenge is that, uh, you know, the total amount of remittances of migrants. Huge. It's three times more. Uh, official development aid. And how can that be used better? Then? That's a very good question because that uh, requires not only the engagement of national governments, but also the engagement of the private sector and international financial institutions. Mm -hmm. That money is used for private purposes and that's fair. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely fair. But uh, the challenge is to create investment possibilities mm -hmm. for part of that money, for only part mm -hmm. of that money. If people feel reassured that they can channel their savings, not just to build the school in the small town where they come from, that's fine, that's fair, but also to bring together those remittances to with the financial investment for public and private entities, to create a strategy of investment in the country of origin. That's what Moldova has been doing. <laughs> and that's we encourage very much other countries to follow doing. Thank you. If I can quickly, th thank you very much. And the amount, by the way, the global amount of remittances last year was 450 50 billion, billion, billion dollars. Just understand this amount. It's huge amount that, of course, I do understand, as you were saying, that it's a government responsibility to try to figure out where to digest these uh, financial flows, but also I'm happy to see to hear that you mentioned about that there are companies that are socially responsible sure. and not only looking for profit, but they're ready to help because it's their own self-sustainable existence. At the same time, I do think that uh, I can give you another example that we have done in the Republic of Moldova. We have a project named Pare One Plus One. For every dollar that a member of the diaspora is investing in Moldova, there is a limit, of course. The government matches. So we are giving 100%. It's a program that we have developed together with the e European Union. This is with EU funds then? This That's is with the EU funds. Yeah. Uh, once in London, and I met Mr. Chakrabarta here from EBRD, 
And I came, we, we were discussing and we were just brainstorming and together somehow we came with this idea, why not we expand the limit? Because for this Moldovan EU project for diaspora, there was a limit. It was about 25,000 up to 5, 000, 50,000 uh, euros total investment uh, matched by the government, which was not bad in, in its say. But we were thinking, why don't we, together with the EBRD or under the guarantee of EBRD as a bank to participate and to match the amount, the bigger amount that the Moldovan diaspora, the one that contributes 20% to Moldovan GDP to create a diaspora development fund, mm -hmm. one hand diaspora members, EBRD and Moldovan government as a sovereign participation and to direct it as, as the director was mentioning to the very important either social or infrastructure projects that can generate also income. So there is also a, a financial reasoning, but also job creation, a social argumentation. And one final, one final um, remark, we were discussing about problems, about crises. We see a crisis of multilateralism right now, and you will see this in every debate mm -hmm. in Davos, in UN, in other fora. But I do think that it's a time to change. And we do need to see the full half of the glass because we have to adapt to the new realities. The reality is e-commerce, but this is an issue that is very difficult to reach consensus in WTO. Mm -hmm. The reality is migration and migration flows every kind that the director was mentioning too. So we are seeing it. Do we need to have a system at all, be it a non-legally binding, mm -hmm. but a platform? and to try to see how we can put things together, corporate, government, NGOs, or we continue like this, chaotic without a system. Mm -hmm. This is an existential question. And I do think that governments have a role, but also we have the role to transform the way we communicate about these issues. That's why we have cases when, unfortunately, the bad situations, they are more promoted in the media. Well, they catch more attention. Why don't we highlight the positive examples this seems to be, I, I know you, you want to come into this, but this is something I, I, I was thinking and I would like to have addressed, but we're going to run out of time. But how, how do we switch the, uh, the, the media attention to this? How, how do we start kind of purveying the positive stories? I wish I could have an answer. Well, yeah. the, you focus on the media, but the, the reality of communication nowadays is much more complex and goes beyond the media. Mm. Well, yes, how do, you, uh, how do you deal with leaders who communicate directly on their social media in, accounts? Yeah, the social media is a, a tool who that do you mean? <laughs> fuels polarization, mm. you know, in general. And uh, migration, one has to recognize, is a subject that is very much prone to polarization. Mm. So the strategy of communication, we need to build on evidence. Fight against distortions, myths, and manipulations. And at the end of the day, the credibility of the messenger is extremely important. Or one challenge is just give the voice to the migrants themselves. They are the best communicators. Mm -hmm. right. I just wanted to say I, I absolutely agree, and I think you know the gloves uh, example is probably the best mm -hmm. one of how you can create a platform, how you can create cooperation, and then it's, you know make sure that people talk about it in the right way, so you create a mass movement. Because you know, again to my point. You can not leave it up to business to, you know, d decide where the money has to go. It, but it be no. either social responsibility or remittances from from the diaspora, because at the end of the day, you either will be compelled to, you know, limited to their vision, or also to their own interests. I mean, one of the reasons why there's so much money flowing into, you know, aging research right now is because all the Silicon Valley billionaires are getting older and they're thinking, <laughs> oh, what can you do about this? So, you know, you have to, as governments and as NGOs and as international corporations, find the right, you know, concrete mm. projects, create the channels, try to find corporates that will, um, you know, get on board with that. And then from the media side, make sure that people talk about it. And so you, you, you create a buzz about it. And by the way, of the technology, I think blockchain, is an incredibly interesting and powerful tool for that. And you can see more and more like infrastructure projects in Africa, for example, starting off and blockchain being an enabler of investment on the ground. So a lot of uh, hope from the private sector, the high technology, but the most important challenge that we face now uh, for the migrant crisis is the hostile 
a climate in, in the rich countries, the walls that are uh, going up. And I would like to um, uh, tell the, uh, the Canadian way of uh, the terminology of the Canadians for integration, which is taboo, it's welcoming. So it could be <laughs> conclusion of uh, my side. <laughs> So more welcoming. Would anyone have any questions for any of our panellists? We can have a, a pause here before we conclude. Yeah, please go ahead. Hi, Deborah Skowski, and I uh, work at the United Nations in the area of human trafficking. So I have a question that I, I don't feel has been uh, dealt with is really health care. Um, and you say 258 million migrants, and whether they're migrants or refugees, IDPs, or there, there is evidence of 40 million um, human trafficking victims. And many are, as they say, traffickers are the fish in the sea of migration. And they're picking off women and children. I mean, you only have to look at the uh, Yazidi community if you really want the people there have hope. And, and although it's great to talk about the economics, the development, the education, the data, if we don't have a really good process for trying to get people into a country, we are, do, you know, it's, it's facts that we get the the traffickers, the ISIS, the gangs, the MS-13, and drugs, and that's not just, you know, that's based on fact and evidence. I, so I'd I think, like a, you know, just a comment. Yeah, but I, I think this is something you could bounce off of, because I know your Moldova has had a problem with human trafficking, and I think maybe you can also, because the Global Migration Compact has tried to address exactly. this as well, so. Exactly. Very quickly, and thank you for the, for the question, mm. because I also happen to be the president of National Anti-Trafficking Committee in, in the Republic of Moldova. And what we did, we have created, and I as the chairman of this committee, we tried to put together, first of all, the first problem we had, the different statistics. The prosecutor office, the Minister of Interior, the border guards, they all have different numbers of victims, of, of victims that have been trafficked. So first of all, it's very important to synchronize the work of the law enforcement agencies. That's what we talk about the, on the uh, protection side. On the prevention side, it's extremely important to raise awareness about the issue and to work with the people, with the potential victims, and to try to give them opportunities for jobs, either or uh, civil society commitment and involvement. Uh, there are three Ps in anti-trafficking. Prevention, partnership, and prosecution. But there is the fourth one, which is extremely important, partnership. And the information change between destination transit and countries of origin is of particular importance. Because we have cases of particularly women and children, but now a more uh, recent phenomena, male trafficking, extremely important uh, for labor, for illegal labor uh, in uh, other countries, but also for begging in different situations. So it's extremely important to have this partnership with other countries. Uh, the challenge we have sometimes is exactly reaching out and to have this information sharing. What we try to do, we try to establish protocols. If, then. If, how to react. It is easier to say than to do. Uh, but we do see a progress. And uh, you're, you're referring to the uh, US there is U.S. Uh, trafficking in persons report. So we have advanced one step higher. But there is a still a long way to go because this is an issue that doesn't relate to only one country. Well, we have a, quite a number of programs all over the world on trafficking in human beings because trafficking and smuggling is the most serious violation of the human rights of the migrants. And they, in fact, uh, there are different layers. First, prevention, as the minister has said, raising awareness, which requires um, the right messengers to pass the message, and the best messengers to speak about the horror, horror of uh, trafficking human beings are the victims themselves. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you need to dismantle the business model, which is a very profitable business yeah. model. In fact, uh, in some estimations, uh, some people say that the profit of trafficking human beings worldwide every year is equivalent to the profit of trafficking in drugs, which can give you the dimension. But when you dismantle, thirdly, sorry, I'll, yeah. Thirdly, you need to have a policy of protecting the victims. Mm. If you do not have a fully fledged policy of uh, protecting the victims, avoiding that they are double victims, victims of traffickers, and then victims of the lack of protection by the countries of destination, you will never have their collaboration. And their collaboration and their participation is essential to dismantle the criminal networks that operate. 
But it can't be almost a half-baked effort. And this is, I think, one of the difficulties we're seeing because dismantling human trafficking networks we've seen in many countries in Europe too is just making migrants take more and more dangerous journeys. So it's, I think it's very easy to say in words, but I think in practice it's a lot more difficult, isn't it? Trafficking networks usually are multinational networks. They operate in different countries and they benefit from the loopholes and gaps of the legal systems, of the cooperation of the law enforcement, and most often <coughs> uh, the effectiveness of the fight against the criminal networks just get into the point of the fingers. Does not see the arm and the command mm. Of the but in the, yes, I agree with you. But in the meantime, migrants are dying. If we look at what's happening in, the, in course, Europe, <coughs> migrants are dying in the seas of Europe. That's why raising awareness and making clear that uh, uh, going through an irregular pathway and <coughs> putting their lives in the hands of traffickers is a very serious danger. But there are no regular themselves. pathways. This is one of the main difficulties. Of course, the regular pathways would reduce the temptation to have recourse to irregular, irregular migration. And we see in a number of countries in the world, even in Europe, some countries that uh, for demographic reasons or for, for because of shortage of manpower are starting to implementing a more open policy mm. of regular migration. But it migration. still remains very theoretical at this stage. At least marginal for mm. the time being. Would anybody else have any questions? Some questions please, behind please. there. Yes. <coughs> this gentleman and then... Thank you. Um, I'm Alexander Betts from Oxford University. One of the most striking correlations, and it holds for the United States, the UK, Germany, is that when you look at patterns of geographical areas where there's anti-immigration sentiment or anti-immigration voting, it correlates with two things, low levels of immigration and broken economic areas. And that tells us that the politics of immigration has not a very strong relationship with the actual migration. Now, one of the things that business can therefore potentially do if it stands to benefit from high-skilled migration, low-skilled migration, and keeping the door open is therefore to engage with those geographical areas that are being left behind because of broken, low-skilled, labor-intensive manufacturing, whether it's in Saxony, Lower Saxony, the north of England, the Rust Belt. So how can we move our migration policies and migration responses to be ones that systematically include citizens and the host communities as beneficiaries of migration processes? Maybe you could answer this, but interestingly, I would say, given the rhetoric in Poland, Poland's economy is actually doing very well. But um, what's your, your position? Yes, and, and th th this is a really very, very good question. And, and I think that there's one dimension to it that is not very much spoken about. Because, you know, obviously, you hear very often the, the argument that, you know, for example, the regions in Germany where there's the strongest anti-immigration sentiment and uh, is the ones who have the least immigrants. But also, also, these are the ones which were part of the, you know, um, Eastern Germany Republic. And I think that the element that you, that people don't factor in, is the, um, fact, the element of change that people can handle. And obviously, like countries like Western Germany or France have become by today multicultural uh, nations or, or, or countries. But they've done so over decades. And you know, they have opened up over the best part of the second part of the 20th century. And people had time to adapt to a certain level of change. And they've not done so without friction. And we've seen it in France, and we've seen it in Germany at various points. So um, I think that you know, the countries that, um, uh, that have come to the European Union after the, the opening of the Soviet bloc they have been extremely homogeneous countries that all of a sudden, you know, were emerged in a multicultural change and people just, you know, weren't made very much prepared for that. And I think it's part of, of change that they are not very comfortable with. And then obviously comes the, the demographics and it comes the part that, you know, the, 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 the parts of, of, of Germany, uh, also the ones that are demographically losing and people see, correlate all that with immigration. And obviously business has, um, has a, a big voice in that and obviously needs to help also to, to help the economic um, balance. But again, and it, it had not always something to do with well-being. I think it has also something to do with the capacity of people to accept change in a certain time. Um, now, I hope I answered the question. Perfectly. But uh, we've only got five minutes left. I'd like to bring in another couple of questions in. So if you can keep your questions brief and your answers brief too, that would be fantastic. So, go ahead. 
and then we'll come to you. So, very briefly, back to the countries of origin. You spoke about development aid and, and about the fact that I think we all agree um, it had limited success, not least because many of the governments are not beacons of good governance. Is there much talk about using free trade as opposed to mm -hmm. aid as tool of addressing the drivers? What we need, no, know in Africa at present is that only least developed countries um, can, for example, export to EU with no tariffs as soon as they're lifted into being able to, in fact, process raw commodities, um, they're subjected to very high tariffs. But that, of course, um, goes back to protectionism and how much, how much of genuine willingness um, you see for addressing that. Who would like to address that? Perfect. I would not necessarily limit it to free trade. I would limit it, I would add free services. Because what is happening is countries like India and the Ukraine, to, for that matter, are providing software services to the developed world. And there really is no limit to that. So I, I think the, the, the part of addressing the employment issue in North America, for example, in Europe, where we can't find enough programmers, enough people to answer the phone and enter an order, in an order entry environment, is to figure out how we can uh, connect with countries, and I'm sure there are programmers in Moldova, they are, I know. You gotta get them. Tell us where they are, they will come. They're in Moldova. Uh, they're all <laughs> providing, <laughs> providing, providing services, and I, I do agree that uh, trading services is, is also something we have to take into consideration. But in principle, I am particularly also in my government, I'm always, always saying that uh, assistance is good, investment is better, trade is better, because this empowers people. Uh, and leaves a narrower margin for the government to take a decision, but in, in the sense where it has to go. And uh, we are free traders, and I, I do agree that uh, some countries, if you open up too fast in trading goods, then you might uh, affect uh, the small and medium enterprises, SMEs, which are not prepared for very, very quick openings. So you have to either have a transition period or to empower them. But for services and in the IT, ICT sector, uh, this is where at least my country, Moldova, has found a good way of uh, opening up the online borders while becoming also very competitive. Now I'd like to bring in this question very quickly as we wrap up. We know that there are a lot of uh, migrant uh, economy or uh, politics, but coming from the sub-Saharan Africa, I know that most of them are environmental migrants. And then there is no yes. like international law who can cover the environmental migrant or recognize them. So we have a lot of internal displays on uh, outside migrant where the responses are humanitarian. But how to combine humanitarian with development together to respond mm -hmm. to them? And also when the discussion coming to the international level, especially Europe, US, or they are migrant and then they meet just between themselves and some of the time calling the head of state to discuss with them. So that is not going to resolve the issue. How they can include the community, the peoples, why they are mi migrating and then build a solution with them. No one like from me who's living on 40 or 50 degree who want to come and live on minus 20 and then we have grandma and cousin and cousin. So not only like family, mom, dad and mm -hmm and children, so how you can uh, help maybe to resolve, so business play a big role, but government also in UN agencies. Absolutely, now could you say a few words of this because we haven't had a chance to talk about the issue of climate refugees and I, and I think many Western nations also play, you know, have some responsibility here because uh, they have some responsibility in the climate change that's taking place in a lot of these countries. So do you think um, climate change migrants should become refugees? Should the terminology actually, should the definition of refugee actually be expanded to, uh, uh, to, to include them? Well, that, we discussion, have 30 seconds okay, that, that discussion was held during the Global Compact mm -hmm. on Refugees, which is yeah. the other compact in parallel of migration, and you won't find it there, which means that the international community was not Ready. prepared. Anyway, the key point is that uh, the um, United Nations system UNHCR, IOM, and the humanitarian coordinator, we have a platform of dealing with displaced people due to disasters, natural disasters, and uh, climate change. And at least the first stage of humanitarian aid, we are there. Then, as the, as the question uh, <laughs> raised, there is the aftermath. And the aftermath is how do we create conditions of livelihood for those people in the new places where they will have to live 
because of climate change. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for their fantastic questions and for participating. We've raised many more questions and answers, but we've also had some concrete action plans that have been broached, which has been absolutely fantastic. So please join me in, in uh, kind of thanking our great speakers. Have been with us today. <laughs>